Let's continue on and look at some more rape provisions. When we examine the old rape statutes, and here is where we focus on the model penal code, and I should say, by the way, that there is an effort right now to revise the model penal codes, rape and other sexual assault provisions so that they reflect the more modern view like we saw in Pennsylvania. But as they stand now, they still are reflective of the the rape statutes of the middle 1900s, so 1950s, 1940s, so on and so forth. And included in that are various special provisions that really stack the deck against the victim and in favor of the defendant. We don't see this in any other kinds of crimes. So this is, again, something that feminists point to and say, this is a clear example of where men are being especially protected, even though the male men are the offenders, they're being especially protected because of these provisions. These provisions made it very difficult to bring a successful rape prosecution. So, for instance, if we look at one of the provisions in the Model Penal Code, the Model Penal Code requires that any kind of charges alleging rape must be brought within three months after the alleged incident occurred. Or if the victim is under 16 years old, three months after their guardian or parent was made known, uh, was made aware of these uh, actions, these alleged actions, this alleged rape. That's an incredibly short statute of limitations. If the victim doesn't come forward within three months, and there are various reasons why she wouldn't, and again, under the model penal code, we talk about she for victims because only women can be raped under the model penal, penal code. But they have to bring this, these allegations to the prosecution within three months of the occurrence. If you wait longer than three months, you're dealing with the emotions of the whole incident. You're scared. You finally, for whatever reason, you delay. You don't report it right away. If you don't report it within three months, there is no prosecution possible. You will find no other crime in the model penal code that has that short of a reporting period. So again, this is really designed to give the opportunity for more rapist to get off the hook, to go free. With such a short statute of limitations, people are going to go free. Another special provision of the Model Penal Code deals with the testimony of the victim. And here, as you read along, the Model Penal Code says, no person shall be convicted of any felony under this article, so no sexual offense, upon the uncorroborated testimony of the alleged victim. Now, what does that mean? What is uncorroborated testimony? It means that the victim's testimony alone cannot lead to the conviction of the rapist. So if there is no other evidence, that's what corrobor uncorroborated means. There's no other evidence. There's no eyewitness. There's no physical evidence. If it's only the victim's testimony, and even if that victim is in entirely credible, this is Mother Teresa on the stand, and nobody would doubt her word, her word alone cannot convict the man of rape. You must have additional evidence. That evidence can be very slight. It can be bruises. It can be other physical evidence on the victim. It can be torn clothing. It can be if the, the rape took place in a some public place like a park. If the police go out and see that the ground is all disturbed, that would be corroboration. But there must be some corroboration. There are virtually no other crimes except maybe some special crimes like treason, um, that require additional corroboration beyond the victim's testimony. Sure, every prosecutor would like to have lots of evidence because that makes the case even easier, but in any other crime, you can bring a prosecution and get a conviction based solely on the victim's testimony. Under the Model Penal Code, you could not do that with rape. You had to have additional corroboration. If we go farther down, in this paragraph, we can see there's another thing that makes a rape conviction less likely because 
the judge, under the model penal code, the judge must instruct the jury. So jury instructions are those instructions given by the judge before the jury goes back at the end of a case into the, the jury room to deliberate. So the judge will tell them what the law is. Here's how rape is defined. Here are any other kinds of special instructions. And the jury will consider those. Well, for rape, there's a very special instruction that the judge must give that almost undeniably invites the jury to not believe the victim. So let's take a look at this. So if you look in the last paragraph of that paragraph of that subsection 5, so if you look at the last sentence, I should say, of that paragraph, it says that the jury shall be instructed to evaluate the testimony of a victim or complaining witness with special care in view of the emotional involvement of the witness and the difficulty of determining the truth with respect to alleged sexual activities carried out in private. So the judge has to instruct, instruct the jury that, look, this rape victim is very emotional, and you should take that into consideration when you consider the truth of her statements. That's about as close as you can come to telling a jury, hey, look, she's really upset. She's probably not telling you the truth. Now, the judge isn't telling the jury to do that exactly because the jury obviously can still believe the witness, whether regardless of her emotional involvement. But nonetheless, it is pointing the jury towards not believing the witness. And the second part that says, because there's difficulty determining the truth with respect to alleged sexual activities carried out in private, also invites it. It's basically saying, hey, there's a good chance she's not telling the truth. These two provisions, number four that says you must report promptly with, and really promptly, and number five that says we must have additional evidence and be careful about believing the victim, really made it much more likely that the jury would come back with a not guilty verdict. Or because of the prompt complaint, the prosecution wouldn't even be able to be initiated because the complaint hadn't been brought quickly enough. Pennsylvania has done away with these provisions. So one of the things that Pennsylvania does is that we have something called a rape shield law, S-H-I-E-L-D, rape shield. And what that says is, there isn't even mention of it in the model penal code, but what Pennsylvania has done to protect victims and to encourage them to come forward is we don't want to turn the trial into a, a trial of the victim. What had happened in the past was the victim would take the stand, they would be questioned by the defense attorney about every sexual partner they'd ever had. And the implication was if you had had sex with someone other than your husband, then you were not a virtuous person, and it's very likely that you probably consented to, this, to sex in this particular case. So instead of making this a crime of the a, the offender, it really became a, I should say, a trial of the offender. It became a trial of the victim. And so many victims just didn't want to go through that and didn't report. Pennsylvania and most and every other state provides protection against that today. And these are known as rape shield laws. And what this paragraph, I'm not going to read through all of it, but what the paragraph basically says is, a defendant can only ask about the victim's past sexual behavior if, number one, the defendant is admitting that they, the defendant did have sex with this victim and that consent is an issue. So in other words, the defendant is claiming, yes, I had sex with this person, but I thought she said yes. Or in Pennsylvania, it could be he said yes. So consent has to be an issue. If the defendant says, I never had sex with this person, then they can't bring in any evidence about the victim's past sexual conduct because it's irrelevant. But if they had had, but if they are claiming that sex was consensual, so that there was sex, but it was consensual, it wasn't by force, it wasn't by the person being unconscious or anything else, then they can bring in some evidence of the victim's past sexual conduct. What kind of past evidence? Only evidence of the defendant's sexual relationship with the victim. So you can't bring in evidence of this victim's sexual past with other people. 
you can only bring in evidence as it pertains to sex between the defendant and the victim. Even then, there will be a special hearing that will be held for the judge to determine the scope of that questioning. So you're only going to get in evidence about the victim's past sexual conduct as it relates to the defendant and only as the judge allows it. So again, we're not going to try to turn this into some kind of major trial of the victim. But if the two had had sex before, then it is admissible as relevant evidence if the pers if the defendant is claiming, but I thought she said yes in this case. So maybe you, maybe the two people, the defendant and the victim had previously acted out various kinds of fantasies that were perhaps even rough and had some elements of violence. So maybe it was part of their sexual past that they had acted out rape type scenarios. In that instance, bringing in information and saying, I thought the victim was really saying yes in this instance could be relevant. But again, any kind of evidence about victims, the victim's past with anyone else would not be relevant. So these are rape shield laws. And again, part B is just saying that there will be a special hearing before the judge to determine the scope and the relevance of this kind of Pennsylvania does away with the model penal codes instruction about the testimony of complainants. So under Pennsylvania, a rape complainant, a rape victim will not be, the credibility of that victim will not be treated any differently than a victim to any other crime. We don't require corroboration. So a rape prosecution can be brought without any additional evidence beyond the victim's testimony. No special instructions will be given to say, be really careful about considering this victim's testimony. So in essence, Pennsylvania's all testimony of rape victims will be treated the same as a victim of any other crime. Pennsylvania also doesn't require special resistance. In the past, most states required that the victim resist to the point of death or to the point where it was resistance was useless. There was the idea that a woman would protect her sexual integrity to the point of death. Pennsylvania doesn't do that anymore. Pennsylvania says you don't have to actually resist, but nonetheless, lack of resistance can be relevant when the, vic when the defendant is claiming there was consent. So if the defendant is saying, I didn't force this person into sex, this person went willingly, the fact that the victim didn't resist could be relevant. But we don't require resistance. We don't say we're going to throw out the case if the victim doesn't resist. And you often saw that in other states.